Assalamu alaikum. The objectives of today's lecture will be to learn about the thyroid gland, its location, its function, the surrounding structures like the muscular relations, the arterial supply and the uh, lymphatic drainage as well as the innervation. This will be all covered in part one of the video. Part two will then look at all the different diseases and how they are <coughs> picked up on investigations and radiology. We'll also be looking at the histology slide later on. Now the thyroid gland is located at the level of C4 and C5 uh, vertebra and it is positioned right in front of the larynx. There are two poles visible here. A superior pole and an inferior pole, one for each lobe of the thyroid gland. Overall, the thyroid gland is composed of two lobes, right and left, and connected by an isthmus at the center. And each lobe has a superior pole and an inferior pole. Sometimes there is a pyramidal lobe also present. This is an accessory one, not present in all thyroid glands. And uh, the overall structure of the thyroid gland is more lobular. If you compare it to the parathyroid glands at the back side, these are more smooth, yellowish, giving a fat-like appearance, and they are four in number, two at the superior portion and two at the inferior portion. These are smooth in comparison to the lobular structure of the thyroid. Functionally, the thyroid gland is responsible for releasing two important hormones, T3 and T4. T4 is called thyroxine while T3 is called triiodothyronine. Uh, the T4 is the active version while T3 is the stored version and they're responsible for mainly in controlling our metabolic rate and from that you can have uh, so many things like the hunger you experience, the amount of sleep that you need, your overall activity, your growth and weight gains and many things which come into that. But let's focus on a bit on the anatomy here. Now Relation-wise, all of the thyroid gland is covered by these strap muscles. For a surgeon, knowledge of these muscles is important because to reach the thyroid gland for removal, thyroidectomy, the surgeon needs to remove each of these structures one by one. First and foremost is your sternocleidomastoid. The sternocleidomastoid goes from the mastoid all the way till the clavicle bone, the medial part. And you can see it has two fibers here with a split in between. These serve their own purposes clinically. But <clears throat> these two muscles are moved to the side so that the center part is more exposed. Now, over here, it's a little going back and forth, the muscles in the center are the strap muscles. From medial to lateral, the center most is called sternohoid. Now look at the name sternohyoid. Sterno stands for the sternum. It is right over here, although not visible. The muscle is attached to the sternum here, the maneuverium part of the sternum. And up to the hyoid bone right over here. So this is your sternohyoid. If I were to hide it, you can appreciate the thyroid cartilage at the back and the thyroid gland at the bottom. The next muscle, and this is the right one, there are two of them, right and left sternohyoid. So let's highest both of them. Usually it is this muscle alone which is cut and reverted so that the majority of the thyroid lobe is experienced. There is another muscle covering it and this one is your sternothyroid. Compared to sternohyoid, this is connected from the sternum to the thyroid cartilage right over here. That was sternohyoid. And this is your sternothyroid. Removing these two, you can appreciate now the entirety of the thyroid gland. And from here, it's much easier to do thyroidectomy. The other muscles which are located here is your omohoid. The omohoid, though, has two bellies. And to see that, we'll have to hide the sternocleidomastoid. Here you can nicely see the superior belly and the inferior belly of the omohoid. So that serves its own purpose on the side. The only remaining structure to show you 
are these muscles. Although they are not, uh, they don't serve any protective role of the thyroid gland. They are closely associated with the larynx at the back. And these are your cricothyroid muscles. Cricothyroid, as the name implies, from the crico to the thyroid. They are mostly involved in voice production. <clears throat> so, again, not directly related with the thyroid gland, but they are there on the back side. So, having that said, these are the muscular relations and they also have a protective function of the thyroid. You also have fascia covering the thyroid, which are not shown here, but later on, I'll show you there's a layer known as the pretracheal layer which covers the thyroid gland. It has a visceral part and a muscular part. The muscular part obviously covers these muscles while the visceral part covers the gland. Arterial supply. Three main arteries supply the thyroid gland. First and foremost, the superior thyroid artery supplying the superior lobe. And this artery is coming from your external carotid artery. This artery in the back, what we see here, is the common carotid and up above, it will bifurcate into internal external. It is the external component which gives off the superior thyroid artery. And this artery descends downwards to supply the superior lobes. You may notice a small branch coming out from the superior thyroid. This is actually the uh, lary <coughs> so, excuse me. This is actually the superior laryngeal artery which goes to supply the larynx. The vein, corresponding vein, is simply known as superior thyroid vein. But the thing is, this vein will drain into the internal jugular vein. Over here, we had the external carotid artery supplying, giving off the superior thyroid artery, while the superior thyroid vein will drain into the internal jugular vein. And this is the same for both sides. Going further down, then we have the middle thyroid vein right over here. Again, this is directly going into the internal jugular vein. Same case over here. There is no middle thyroid artery as such. However, if you see over here at the back side, there is an inferior thyroid artery. And this artery is coming from the subclavian artery on both sides. From the subclavian, the inferior thyroid ascends, passes through the common carotid from the behind, and then supplies off the lower lobes on both sides. Same case over here, you can see the inferior thyroid artery. And here it's coming from the left subclavian artery. And keep in mind, the right subclavian artery is coming from the right brachiocephalic artery, which is not present here on the left side. Brachiocephalic divides into common carotid and right subclavian. This is the anatomical difference from right and left. So two major arteries, superior thyroid, inferior thyroid. There is a thyroid ema artery, which usually comes from the center right over here. That can be considered a middle uh, thyroid artery, but again, it's accessory, not always present. From the brachiocephalic trunk, it ascends and supplies the middle isthmus not shown here and the corresponding vein for the inferior thyroid artery is your inferior thyroid vein the right one draining into the right brachiocephalic vein while the left one also draining to the left brachiocephalic vein but look what they're crossing the right one crosses the right brachiocephalic artery from the front the left one goes in directly mostly crossing the precoid cartilages so this was your arterial supply for the surgeon, knowledge of this is also very crucial. He must ligate each of these arteries before performing the thyroidectomy. The vein and the artery from above, superior thyroid artery and vein, middle thyroid vein, and inferior thyroid artery and vein. The inferior thyroid artery, because it's so deeper, usually it can it's, uh, it's not prone to damage. The other ones are prone to damage. Nevertheless, each should be or, uh, ligated or cauterized before removing. Then we come to the nerve. Now, the nerve is actually even more fragile than the vessels and more likely to be injured. Parasympathetically, you have the vagus nerve coming from above. The vagus nerve comes from the medulla. It has several nuclei, but the nerve itself, as it descends, it divides into superior laryngeal nerve, and this will then supply the larynx or voice box. The remainder of the vagus nerve goes down 
between the esophagus and the trachea. The esophagus is not shown here, but you can see here <coughs> how the nerve is descending downwards. In front you have the trachea, behind will be the esophagus. And it is at this portion where it forms the characteristic loop. This loop is actually going around the left subclavian artery and then it will ascend upwards again to enter into the inferior part of the larynx and supply the inferior part of the voice box. But this same nerve also is supplying the thyroid gland on the back side. This nerve is the thing that we should look out when doing thyroidectomy and this is the one which is usually injured. The clinical uh, classical scenario is after thyroid surgery, a person experiences hoarseness of voice. That hoarseness is due to an injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Characteristic, a classical scenario. So superior laryngeal nerve is coming from the top side and recurrent laryngeal from the bottom. Both are part of the vagus nerve. You'd also have your sympathetic chain supplying this. Since it's a visceral organ, there is a parasympathetic supply and then there is a sympathetic supply. Here I already shown you the parathyroid. They are responsible for releasing parathyroid hormone and controlling the levels of calcium in the blood. So we will do that separately. Let's, not, let's focus on the last bit now. The lymphatic drainage. Lymphatics of thyroid is crucial to an oncologist. Why? Because malignant cancers of the thyroid can easily spread through these nodes and then affect surrounding structures which are very vital. You have so many vital structures here like the carotid arteries and the facial structures up there. So if you were to zoom in, the important nodes are the number one, pretracheal. Pretracheal, as the name says, is in front of the trachea. These can be affected and from here they can go into the deep cervical chain on the sides. You can see there's a whole line of nodes here and uh, although not visible, these nodes are going alongside the vessels. The rule is lymphatics always follow the vessels. From pretracheal, they can go to the deep cervical chain. And uh, then we have the prelaryngeal node at the bottom right here. Pretracheal was at the top, prelaryngeal at the bottom. These two are your, call them as sentinel nodes because of the first lymph nodes which are involved. From there, they can go to the paratracheal nodes as well. These will go deeper down below, but up above, the cervical chain, the deep cervical chain, will then connect the top sides. So this was basically the thyroid gland and all its major anatomical features. We will be looking at the clinical aspect in the next video.